you may not have known, but you're coming to a laboratory tonight. This is a laboratory for our students to work, get real world skills on real productions. Well, baby, when I think about you, well, I think of love, 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 love. It's such an honor to have you here tonight, and I'll let Molly kick things off. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if, to start things off, you could talk about your introduction into the music world and how you kind of began working with your father, who was a big promoter for Prince and Bobby Womack, right? Yes. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, maybe mine is the reverb. <laughs> uh, yeah, so growing up, my father did promote shows, and you know I'm from a family of five kids, and we all helped with promoting the shows because then you didn't have Facebook and Twitter, so he would have flyers, and we'd go out with him and my mom and hand out the flyers to people and tell them to come to the shows and go to the radio station and things like that and try to promote the shows and tell people how they need to come out. And... Um, so when I first moved to Memphis and I decided that I wanted to go and start playing music, it was kind of easy for me to, um, once I got a gig at a place like Java Cabana, I needed to tell people about it. And because I had seen him promoting shows, it was really easy. I just went over to FedEx, which was being Kinko's, and made some flyers and was beating everybody over the head I could. Like, come to my show. Come to my show. It made it easy that I was working at the coffee shop because I was serving the same people that would be coming to the show. <laughs> Here, take this with your coffee. You know, yeah. So um, that's kind of how... I started here in town, and then also we would hang up posters on, on you know, uh, tele telephone poles, and, you know, so I was doing that, too. I'd make bigger flyers, and I'd get out at night and hang them on telephone poles, and many of the people that are in this room tonight helped me hang posters on telephone poles. <laughs> so, yeah, all of that. It was an interesting start that I didn't know was going to lead to my own path in music. When was like your first moment when you were like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life? <sighs> when I was a little girl, I wanted to do it for the rest of my life, but I didn't believe in myself. I was like, no, I can never be like Whitney Houston. I can never be like Tracy Chapman. They're way too far from me. You know, I'm from this little town, Humboldt Jackson. Like, I'm never going to be able to do that. So I always told myself what I couldn't do, but... um I like a challenge, so <laughs> getting into music was kind of a challenge for me, and um, as much as I told myself the things that I could not do every single day while I was serving coffee or while I was cleaning houses or walking dogs or picking up laundry and taking it to whoever's mansion, I would be singing along the way, and I'd be writing all along the way, and I would be telling myself that maybe, you know, I have to believe, I have to believe that I can manifest a dream. And I think that's what it's been about more than anything is just like manifesting a dream because there's so many people in the world that, you know, want to manifest things and um, want to bring into being some beautiful vision. But it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of patience and dedication. And, um, and I wanted to do that with my life. It could have been art. It could have been, you know, owning my own cafe or owning my own pottery plant, uh, pottery studio or whatever. You know, I have a lot of dreams, but I said, well, I'm not going to be able to do one if I don't focus. You know, maybe I will end up owning a pottery studio one day and being a great potter, but the first one is music, you know. Where's my passion really? So there it lies. And I had to really just focus. And I said, if I can manifest this one, then not only can I inspire other people to be leaving themselves and to manifest things that they feel are impossible, but I can also manifest another one. Like, I really love yoga. I can manifest becoming a yoga instructor and traveling all over the world and being on the Swiss Alps up there doing my little pose, you know? <laughs> so, you know, one, I figured once I got one down that it would be easy for me to just draw in the things that I want. Because if you're not living the life you wish to live, then why be here, you know? You might as well enjoy this ride. So 
that's kind of what it's been about for me. And music was the way. And I wanted to choose something that was difficult for me, too, because, you know, if I just some things I'm like I'm I'm really good at. And if I chose the one that was really easy, then ah, big whoop. You know, I mean, anybody could do the one that's really easy. But to take something that's very far away from you, but that you feel really passionate about and to really like sit with it like you're tending a garden and like nurture it every single day. I wanted to believe that when they said reap what you sow, I wanted to believe it was true, but you really don't know until you apply these things that you hear, the sayings. You don't know until you apply them to your everyday life what they really mean. So yeah, that's why I chose to do it. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so when you first moved to Memphis, did you feel like the city itself was influencing you and kind of like driving you um, and other artists that were working in the city at the time? When I first moved to Memphis, I was so inspired by all the creative people that were coming into the cafes where I was working because I was double time and I was working at a place called Deliberate Literate in the morning. And then I work at Java Cabana at night and I'm sure they weren't too happy about that, but I was doing it. And um, I met people like, you know, Craig Brewer there and... Um, he was working on Hustle and Flow every day. You know, he was up there at six o'clock in the morning. I served him his coffee. He worked, I got off around noon, went to another job. He was still there when I got off at noon. If I went over to Poor and Hungry, he was over there. You know, people who had dreams who were really working towards those things. And he was telling me, yeah, I'm writing a movie. I'm like, okay, great. We'll see what's gonna happen with this guy, you know? <laughs> Another fella that I used to, you know, serve coffee to was Darius. Um, Darius, he would come in, and I've seen him in Nashville. He'd be like, yeah, I want to be an actor. I want to move out to L.A. and be an actor. Ekendayu, who has Hadaloo Theater here, he'd be like, yeah, one day I'm going to own a theater. I'm going to do all this stuff. It was really a powerful place to be at that time in Memphis because it was all of these young people. And when I say young, I mean anywhere from... I was 18, so I was young, but they were, you know, in their 20s, late 20s, early 30s, which is where I am now, and they were working towards these impossible things, and now Hattie Lou is there, it's physical, you know, and, you know, Java is there, and, you know, Craig is there in his dream, and it's just, and the type of books that people were reading, things like The Alchemist or Illusions, to have those kinds of books being read around me and be like, hmm, that's an interesting person. What are they reading? A book about a journey about a boy who's going to follow his dream. Hmm, okay, I've read that book. Every time I get low on my energy, I read that book again. It takes me a couple of hours, and it makes me feel very empowered, and I keep my you know, wits about me, even though the world is shooting daggers. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm, gonna, I'm like, you can't tell me no, you know. <laughs> can't be told, you know. Sometimes you need to not be told. Sometimes you need to just get out there and fall and fail and get up and do it again. And I have to believe that all of the people that I, you know, met along the way here have experienced that same kind of stuff. And I've seen them, you know. Um, speaking of Craig Brewer, could you talk a little bit about your involvement with $5 Cover and kind of that project and the other artists that were involved with that? Yeah, it was really funny because I'd, um, I'd known Craig for a while and he, he kind of was like, I want you to try out for this part in Hustle and Flow. It didn't really work because they wanted that my hair was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, we don't know how to get it in a wig and the character actually uses this kind of hair would you ever be able to cut it or do any I was like ah. <laughs> I knew then that my hair was going to be more famous than me <laughs> but no I'm joking but um I get so jealous of my hair sometimes <laughs> but so he he'd asked he tried to give me a chance you know this old girl working like he's seeing me you know working 12 and 15 hours a day and sleeping barely you know and just pushing and you know he was just kind of like well, I'll give her a chance. I'll give her a chance. And none of those other roles worked for me. But when $5 cover came along, it was like I could be myself. 
And he did that not just for me, but for Jack O, for Amy LeVere, for Al Capone. And he also brought together the community of musicians that were like, like I would go to a Jack O show, but not that many colored people would just bust up in a Jack O show. You know what I mean? So he brought in Al, and Al and Jack were talking to each other, and, you know, brought me with Amy, you know, and it's just really cool that he brought together all those different genres of music, because we have a lot of music in this town, but, you know, if you like punk, you like punk, and you go to the punk show, and if you like soul, you like soul, you go to the soul show, but he kind of brought it all together, reeled it in. And there are those people that just love music. They go to everything. So I kind of was trying to be like that because I wanted to soak up as much as I could. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Pushing Against the Stone because it's been incredibly successful. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk about your sound and kind of how it evolved and how that album came about. Well, the album was made because of the Kickstarter backers. They gave me, you know, I raised um, with Kickstarter's crowdfunding, which is through the internet. Um, I think it was about a little more than $15,000 to make a record. And I then, shortly after that, I met Kevin Agunas and Dan Arabach. And Dan, I didn't know this, because I knew that Black Keys were from uh, Akron, Ohio. He... Kevin had worked with Dan on some Black Keys stuff. He's from out west, and he was like, who would you like to work with? And I was over at Central Barbecue. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> with Kevin in line, Kevin flew in, listened to me play 100 songs on the porch of my friend's house, and was like, I want to make a record with this girl. And, uh, and so he said, well, who would you like to work with songwriting-wise or other musicians that you admire? And I said, I like Gillian Welch. I like the way her records are made. I like... Um, M. Ward, and I like Dan Auerbach. And he said, well, I know Dan Auerbach, and let me get him on the phone right now. The line is long at Central Barbecue, so we had time to do all of this. <laughs> so he gets him on the phone, and he's like, well, I got this girl from Memphis, and she wants to make a record, and she needs to record some songs, but she also needs to write a few more songs as well, and she's interested in co-writing with you. And uh, he said, well, I'm in Europe right now, but when I get home, home being Nashville, and I didn't know that, just tell her to get on the road and come right down, and we will get together and write songs. So we went into John Prine's studio there in Nashville, and we wrote two songs. One I'm going to start with tonight. We wrote two songs on the first day, and I was just like, is this my life? I'm in John Prine's studio with Dan Arbuck writing songs about Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so that was our first session. Then we had another session in March, and we wrote, like, a couple more numbers. And then Dan said, you know, we really need to record these songs. And I was like, okay, um, I'm going to make this record with the Kickstarter money, but I'm doing it with another producer that I greatly respect, Craig Street. And he was like, well, that's fine, but I want to let you know that all this time I've been building a studio in Nashville, and it's about to be finished, and it's called Easy Eye Studio, and you should come, and we should record some of these songs. I said, well, I don't really have another budget. I've been working all my years, and I finally got enough to make this record and I ain't got a budget to be going to your studio too so he said you know just make a decision what you want to do and I said I sat with myself for a while just like man that's such a good opportunity but I like that opportunity too and just I mean it's raining opportunities yes good 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 so I finally decided to go with Dan because we had written the songs together and I always try to let the songs lead me so um this we went in and Jimbo Mathis was there, and Eric Deaton, he's from, you know, both of them are Mississippi guys, and then uh, Richard Swift flew in from out west with Kevin, and we just all sat around and came up with half of this record. I left, and I was not very happy because I felt like, I felt like it went all over the place, and I just was like, I feel like there's more to do. I didn't feel complete. And so I left there, and I was signed to BMG. That's the first thing I ever signed was a deal with an amazing woman, Kate Hyman, at BMG. And she really loved my music and wanted to help me in every way she could and still does. And she said, I got this guy out west I want you to go write songs with. Uh, his name's Booker T. Jones. Um, <laughs> would you like to go out and do that? And I was like, yeah. 
just slapped me twice and put me on the plane, you know. So I went out there, and we sat together, and he was so nurturing. He had a wall of, like, platinum records and gold and stuff. And when I told him about, you know, the recording experience, and I said, I feel like I need to have more of me represented on the record because I don't just like gospel. I don't just like soul. I don't just like, you know, blues. I like country. And he said, well, come here, look at this one. And he showed me the one that he did with Willie Nelson, but he's done records with all kinds of people. He said, this is one of the biggest records of that year. And he said, if you want to do some country songs for this record, do some country songs for this record. Don't just stop with what you already have. You know, Don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. And of course, me, I like to be told I can't do something because that makes me want to do it. <laughs> I'm like, I can do it. So he's like, so how about you come back in here in this room? And he started playing some something on um, the keys and he said I've been working on this country song for years and he said but I don't have the lyrics and so I'm flipping through my book which I call my journals they're skeletons and there's little pieces of songs in these skeletons sometimes when I get a song I get the whole song and sometimes I just get a piece so um, I'm flipping through and he's playing and I'm like no nah, that doesn't fit no nah, that doesn't fit no nah. and finally I find the one on my way and I'm like it fits so perfectly with the music that he was playing and I was like this is such a good we have to write this song and I played him my, another song that I'm going to play for y'all tonight I played him the first song that I had written on the ukulele and it's called Somebody to Love and he he was like, would you let me come to the studio to play organ on that song? Because it's so pretty. And I was like, you want to play on my record? Yeah. So I called <laughs> Kevin, who was the producer who lived out there, who co-produced with Dan. And I said, Booker T. Jones wants to come over tomorrow and record some numbers that we just, you know, have sat here and worked on. He said... Absolutely, Booker T. Jones, yes, we're, yeah, I'll get him in here. <laughs> so we went in and we did that. And then I still didn't feel like it was finished because I was like, you know, the blues isn't properly represented on this record. Yeah, you can't be told it's got some blues feeling, but I really want, you know, to record this number that I've written, Working Woman Blues, and I want to do it and get it on this record because it hadn't been recorded. So when I went to Budapest, I met up with some Hungarian musicians and particularly my friend Peter Schabach and the way he and the drummer played on that working woman, it took it from being just a basic blues song to like being like Al, uh, like a Fela Kuti song or the energy and the power behind it. And I had a Hungarian friend who's a trumpet player, Bada Bash Lawrence, and I said, well, can I get my trumpet player friend to come over? And he came over and put down, I mean, we did that in 30 minutes. We did that recording of Working Woman Blues in 30 minutes. It was just like, boom, boom, all right, all right, I love it. And so um, I felt then that the record was complete, but it took about three years, and it took a lot of other people believing, and it took a lot of different producers and all of that stuff. So it's a lot. <laughs> Um, I, I think that's so fascinating that you had to fly out west to meet Booker T. Jones to put a country song on your <laughs> album in Nashville. I know, I, 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 I know. That, I think that's awesome. Um, well, I mean, with all this talk of uh, the music, I think it's about time to hear some. So yeah, so let's 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 hear a little bit. Sounds good. Okie dokie. So I'm going to start with this song called Tennessee Time. I'm going to check the tuning first, though, because I feel like I can take my time. <laughs> a lot of times I'm rushing in a place and rushing out. and I want it to be right. A little wrong, though, not just right. <laughs> yeah, all right. Running on Tennessee time Running on Tennessee time There's a tap at my window There's a ring at my 
door in dial answer in Tennessee time But Houston's a hard town New York's not for mine And every town I drift through well, I just can't unwind New Orleans hustle keeps a warm down Waters so high, high, high can't touch the ground Running on Tennessee time Running on Tennessee time Well there's a tap in my there's a ring in my door in dial answer in Tennessee time. Well, I thought there'd be something in those bright lights. But all I got was lonely, sleepless nights. So when I get to Tennessee, I'll never leave again. Running on Tennessee time, running on Tennessee time. Well, there's a tap in my window, there's a ring in my door, and I'll answer in Tennessee time. Running. There's a tap in my window, there's a ring in my door, and down and serving Tennessee time. Sitting down and serving Tennessee time. Oh, I'll answer in Tennessee time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so that's a number that I wrote that one in Tennessee, and I wrote it about how we kind of move in our own speed here. <laughs> you know, the rest of the world is going and zooming all by, but we kind of say, okay, I'll see you at 10, and it really means we'll be there about 10 15 or 10 30 and you're supposed to be okay with that because we move when we want to move and we get it done tcb <laughs> it happens it does happen so people are not to worry about our tennessee time but they're supposed to just be okay with it this is a number that i did with booker who's also from memphis for those people who don't Remember, because he's been gone so long. And this instrument was made in Memphis and given to me for my birthday by my friends. It's amazing. This is the baby. And she traveled all over the world. She really did. But she wasn't supposed to travel, the baby wasn't. When I first received her, I thought she was just a toy. And I said, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> it's cute, but it's not a real instrument. And so I was leaving the house with the mama who's here. And I had Clyde then, that was my guitar, my first guitar. And I was leaving the house and traveling all over the place. And I'd come home and the baby would be crying. She was devastated. She could not take it. And I'd just be like, just chill out. We're tired. We just got off the road. You're going to have to take it easy and relax. She'd be like, why are you crying anyway? I want to go on the road. I want to be a big star. And I was like, mm -mm. I don't even know what you are. 
twinkle, twinkle. And so one day she cried so loud, and I was headed over to Hungary, and I was like, well, I guess maybe I should... I said to her, if you can fit inside of my big gray suitcase, which is about this big with heels and dresses and brooches and all kinds of cool, like, joy like this, when I love this flashback, I love that. <laughs> Anyways, but I said, if you can fit in there with all of that stuff, then I will give you a chance on the road. And she fit in there with shoes all around her, just, I didn't do it right. And she got over to Hungary. And one night, she started singing her song. Because every time she would cry, she would say how lonely she was. And I just couldn't take it. I was just like, okay, look, finally, what's this lonely song you want to sing? And it went like this. Said if you're tired and feeling so lonely, you wake up at night thinking that only if you had somebody will I be somebody, somebody to love. But if they tell you there were plenty of fish in the sea But you're out in the cold and you're feeling empty Or oh, you're looking for somebody Will I be somebody Somebody to love Will I be somebody you guys. So I call the music that I make organic moonshine roots music, <laughs> which means I told you about the organic process in which this music was born here in Memphis, like a lot of great music was born in Memphis, him with his little puppy dog, you know, was born here, and it's really magical as a melting pot for sounds. A lot of times I find that because I'm a black woman from Memphis, people often think, oh, well, she's going to sing soul automatically. And the second thing that they think is, oh, well, she's going to sing reggae. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> guys, that's not all we have there. You know, we also have a nice touch and a nice flavor of Southern gospel and Southern spirituals. And I really love playing organic moonshine roots music because you have to play a little bit of southern spirituals. One of my favorites 
that I always enjoyed when I was at the church, if they would call the number of this song, is this one. Because I never really felt like I was an earthling. I felt like I was from some magical fairyland that had a lot of turquoise blue sparkly things flying around. <laughs> So when they call the number for my song, I get really happy. This world's not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. But the angels picking me from heaven's open door, and I can't fill that home in this world anymore. Well, oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. And if heaven's not my own, then Lord, what will I do? But the angels picking me from heaven's open door, and I can't fill that home in this world anymore. One thing I know, but my Savior pardoned me, so now I onward go. Well, I know He see me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't bled home in this world anymore. Well, oh Lord, Lord, you know I have no friend like you, and if heaven not my own, tell me what else shall I do? But the angels picking me from heaven's open door. And I can't be at home in this world anymore. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mm. Just up in glory's land, we'll live eternal. But the saints on every hand, they are shouting victory. But their songs the sweetest praise drip back from heaven's shore. And I can't be at home in this world anymore. But oh, Lord, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. And if heaven not my own, tell me, Lord, what will I do? But the angels picking me from heaven's open door. And I can't be at anymore, say, well, I can't be at home in this world anymore, you know that I can't be at home in this world anymore. It's called The Stranger. It's the only guitar I have right now, acoustic. So it's really an important guitar, because if anything happens to it, I'm out of business. <laughs> but luckily, I have Martin, and they love me now, so I should be doing OK. <laughs> but one thing I found about playing organic moonshine roots music is that you have to play a murder ballad right after you play a gospel song. <laughs> because a little, just a little wrong keeps you right. No, that's not really why. I'll tell you why. Because there's all of these murder ballads out there, and they're all about like the woman being murdered, and it just seemed like Pretty Polly and Handsome Molly and all of those murder ballads needed a female perspective on them. 
so I wrote this song called Shotgun. It's what happens when you say, baby, don't go. Don't leave me. Don't go down to New Orleans. Why would you want to do that when you got Memphis? But baby wants to do whatever they want to do. In the meantime, green time, I wrote this song, Shotgun. Dup, 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 dup. Oh, oh, baby, well, you know I love you, baby, I'm in love with you, yes, I am. I saw you in her arms, darling. Yes, well, I saw you kiss her lips, baby. And come back home and tell me your sweet. So, I'm gonna go get my shotgun darling Cause you know I love you baby And if I can't have you, nobody can. Late last night they laid you in your own some grave And don't you know tonight they lay me beside you That's a murder ballot for you. <laughs> Thank you. So this is the mom. She keeps the baby warm. They fly in the same case, and they travel all over the world together. She's not... She never expected to have a baby so soon in life. <laughs> she kind of goes out after the gigs and really does it up. She ties one on regularly by having way too many whiskeys, and I just... 
I go home because, you know, I got interviews to do and photo shoots, and I don't want to look too, too tired. I might stay out and talk and kiss a few babies and shake a few hands, but that's about it. But the mom, she gets wild. <laughs> and I'm like, girl, you got to get it together. Because she leaves me there, her and Big Red. Big Red isn't here. She's the electric guitar that Luther Dickinson gave me. When I said I was going out with this record, he gave me a, an electric guitar. He said, you're going to have to play electric for some of these numbers. And so I left Big Red because she ends up in all kinds of places where she's not supposed to be. And I couldn't take the risk. I said, we're going to Memphis, and if you end up in California, what am I going to say to the crowd? So I just... I decided that the best thing to do was just bring the mom, because if I have one party animal on the team, it's okay. But she keeps me up all night long. I'm up. And I'm thinking, well, what time is she coming in tonight? Sometimes I don't even go to sleep worrying about whether she's coming in or not. <laughs> always a need for a song about the weather. When you're in foreign countries and you're dealing with people who know how to speak English but they're a little shy about it, if you just bring up the weather, even if you're in the foreign grocery store, nice day, beautiful weather, they kind of cheer up and start to talk to you a little bit. So I like to start with this song oftentimes when I'm playing for a foreign crowd. Well, baby, when I think 
think about you. But I think of love, love, la 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 la, love, 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 la la la, love, 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 love. And now in the morning, waking up alone, waiting by the phone, and well, it's all over. Now I said, baby, blue, well, it's all over because we got you. Well, I'm gonna do my rain dance, gonna wash it dust, and the bank gonna do my rain dance. Dusty, dirty, wait. So I'm gonna do my rain dance, gonna wash it dust, and the bang, gonna do my rain dance. So I'm gonna do my rain dance, gonna wash it dust, and the bang, gonna do my rain dance. Da 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 When I close my eyes, well, I get the feeling I'm needing some healing. I'm needing some healing. Well, I'm gonna do my rain dance, gonna wash it dust, and the bank gonna do my rain dance. Well, I'm gonna do my rain rain dance, gonna wash it dust, and the bank gonna do my Thank you. So you made the move to New York. Um, and um, uh, t tell us a little bit about what that's been like and uh, follow it up with what's it like coming back to Memphis? Um, um, well, I kind of feel like I live on the water in a sense because I'm on the road so much and I'm just starting to come off the road after... What I say is about two years, and what my friends and family say is about four years. <laughs> um, so finding home is a little bit strange. So I always think, you know, I have my apartment in New York, but I think of Memphis and Tennessee as home. So I go up there, and I'm with my things, like my cast iron skillets and my pottery and eating off my plates and out of my forks, and I'm using my forks, and I'm feeling okay, but... I don't exactly feel at home yet in New York, and it's been four years that I've been there. So I'm glad that I'm there because it's very easy to get in and out of this country when you're using New York as a base. So if I'm passing through, coming from Europe, and I have to go out to California, it's really nice to ease on in there and cook myself a meal in my own kitchen. And it's great, but I always feel like I have to come back to Memphis and be around my friends and family in order to feel like I really got a dose of home, you know. But uh, when I met Loretta Lynn, you know, I met her at the Ryman a few weeks ago when I sat down beside her. I was like, Miss Lynn, I love your music. And I said, well, I got one question for you. How long have you been on the road? And she said, because she said, um, you know, I'd love to hear you sing tonight. You look really pretty, and I'm sure you can sing pretty good because they got you up here. She said, but I got to leave. As soon as I received my award, I got to leave. And I was like, wow, okay. I'm kind of sad because I wanted Loretta Lynn to hear me sing. But she, I said, well, where are you going? And she said, well, I, I'm on tour. I got to get on the bus and get out of here. She's like in her 70s. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you mean it never ends? How long have you been on the road, Miss Lynn? She said, well, I've been on the road for about 50-some years. And I was like, wow. 
And then I met Taj Mahal, and I was at the same event, and I was like, well, let me just ask all these older folks how long they've been on the road. <laughs> and Taj, how long you been on the road? I've been on the road since I was nine, and I'm 72. <laughs> And I said, Lord, how long am I going to be on the road? <laughs> so, you know, but you begin to find home on the stage for me. I began, to feel, I began to feel like I was at home when I hit the stage, you know. I get up, get in the vehicle, whatever it is moving, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> get, you know, my tea late in the day, do my walk, do my sound check, do my little meditation. And by the time I get on the stage, these are my pots and pans and my, you know, familiar things, my comforter or whatever. That's why they have names and they have character because they become my companions, you know, when I'm traveling. So home is here in Memphis. Home is in New York, but it's really on the stage. Um, so how did your Memphis friends feel about your move, like particularly the artists and the musicians? Were they a little bit? bitter or were they more supportive in general or how was it everybody was really supportive because I didn't move for music I didn't move for art I moved for love and they were like well we know when she's found somebody she loves she just does what whatever we can control her you know so they kind of let me go um, but I've been returning home pretty much every two months to a month, you know, just because I miss everybody. And Capricorns are said to be big on family and friends, and my friend family and my family family is mostly in Tennessee, so I usually return. If I'm not on the road grinding too hard, then I'll get back and at least grab a meal with some good friends and go see my mom and dad and everybody. So looking forward, like, what's next for you? Like, what big projects? What's going to happen in 2015 and beyond that? Well, I think one of the most important things about following a dream and a journey and a path that you don't know where you're going, <laughs> because it's like that. I mean, you kind of can say, oh, I'm going to do this when this date rolls around and stuff. I make goals, I do have them, but one of the most important things is to not talk about the things that you're going to do, just to do them. So the time that I could spend sitting here telling you what I'm going to do in 2015, which is probably sit around the house and gain some weight and eat a bunch of food and chill, <laughs> chilling, you know, sit on my tail and rejuvenate, but if it's not that, then <laughs> I'm going to have to, you know, I, w I wouldn't tell you. I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> I just keep it to myself because when you're, it's very important to kind of leave the baby in the incubator for a little bit, like just kind of let it sit there and grow. Whatever it is, let it grow. And then, and then you can tell people about it later. Yeah, they'll see because you've been doing the, the service that you need to do. It's the reap what you sow. It really does happen. So even if it's a bad thing. <laughs> um, would you mind playing one more song for us? Please? Not at all. <laughs> Yay. So um, it's a number from my record, Pushing Against the Stone. And it's a number called Twine and Twisted that I wrote when I was living on Overton Park Avenue. I was taking care of family over there, and they let me live in the carriage house. It was fun. Waking up and hearing the monkeys. <laughs> the zoo right there. But the thing about it is that I never had received a song this way before. And... Usually when I receive a song, I hear a voice, or I might be playing an instrument, and then I hear the voice. Um, but this time I was sleeping, and I heard the voice. And I only heard the voice and the lyrics. And when I woke up, I remembered it. I remembered it because it was beautiful. It was the prettiest voice. And I was like, am I supposed to sing that song? Is it like in the world? But I knew that it wasn't, so I had to bring it in. And so I sang it, and I still sing it, but I do it 
you know, no justice compared to what I received that night. Valerie June, everybody. 